Throughout the clinical encounter, a refining process should be taking place based on the patient's story and your own observations. The end stage of this ongoing refining process will be the formal stage of differential diagnosis. At the beginning of the consultation, there may be several possible pathologies explaining the patient's condition, but as more information is gathered, the clinician is able to identify common threads that will lead towards the direction of the most probable diagnosis. Throughout the history, keep an open mind of possible pathologies that could explain the patient's symptoms and signs. The more relevant information you can gather, the more likely you are to arrive at a diagnosis. At the end of the history and physical examination, draw up a refined list of possible conditions. This is essentially your differential diagnosis for this clinical presentation. A good differential diagnosis should contain only those pathologies justified by the facts. Bear in mind that a patient could have more than one pathology at any one time. Further consideration of the facts gathered so far or results from investigations should help you reduce the differential diagnosis list. You have now arrived at the most likely condition or working diagnosis to which treatment may be directed. Let us illustrate this with a very simple example. A patient presents with pain in the leg. Obviously, without further information, the differential diagnosis would include a wide list of pathologies. Attempting to identify a pathology at this stage would result in an indiscriminate list of conditions. The etiologies would include muscular, bony, capsuloligamentous, vascular, infective, neurological, degenerative, and other causes. In fact, at this stage, without any further information or tests, we might end up including the whole of the pathological sieve. However, even at this very early stage, a refining process to the line of questioning should be evident. For instance, by simply knowing the gender and age of the patient, your inquiries may be tailored to what is relevant for that person. Although a word of caution here as refining the line of inquiry too early or too much may miss surprising outcomes. Therefore, if in our example the patient is an 18-year-old male, then in your refining process you would have perhaps ranked higher the possibilities of sports-related trauma and lower the possibility of degenerative changes. But without further details, all considerations must be maintained whilst more information is gathered. If we now fast forward this clinical encounter to a point after the case history and physical examination have been carried out, you should be in a position to localize the source of the pain and the structure involved. Let us assume the pain was localized over the tibia. Your case history yielded information that the patient recently took up sprinting. After having examined the leg, and you have excluded the adjacent joints, the vascular and neurological supply, and the possibility of infection, one of the possible diagnoses could be shin splints. This example was meant to illustrate that the refining process starts from the case history and runs through the whole clinical encounter. If this ongoing refining and clarifying process is not carried out during case history, the interview would be lengthy and indiscriminate. Similarly, the clinical examination would be an endless list of investigations. This is one of the reasons why it is important to begin your case history with a wide and inclusive approach, refining and narrowing down your line of inquiry in response to information gathered. Similarly, any early clinical investigations should be as inclusive as possible, reserving the most specific, intrusive or risky tests or procedures for later on if they are deemed necessary. Take the case of a middle-aged woman with a swollen, painful wrist. 
you would not select to test for the tissue marker HLA-TR4 or synovial fluid aspiration if you haven't first progressed through a logical examination algorithm. In this instance, you should start your clinical investigations with a general musculoskeletal assessment, then progress if necessary to joint specific tests, a full blood count and ESR, X-rays, special hematologic tests, synovial fluid aspiration, MRI scan, arthroscopy, and so on. Let us now recap the main points we have covered. Ensure that you and your clinical setting is prepared to receive the patient. Introduce yourself and explain the procedure to the patient. Ensure that the general case history covers the following sections. The patient's personal details, the presenting complaint, the history of the presenting complaint, past medical history, drug history, family history, personal and social history, and systems inquiry. Case history taking is not a textbook learning activity. It requires numerous diverse clinical encounters with many patients affected by a variety of conditions. To speed the development of history taking skills and to help build confidence, students and newly graduated clinicians are encouraged to observe as many consultations as possible and to practice role play with fellow students and colleagues.